Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Heated Shenanigans Podcast. I am your host, Scott, and as you can see, joining me today is one of the most decorated men in all of professional wrestling, one half of the legendary Dudley Boys, Devon Dudley. How are you doing? I'm Scott? good. How are you doing? I can't decide if I want my glasses on or off. <laughs> got beaters <laughs> that look like women glasses, so I'm actually, so I can see better, but eh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, uh, Devon, I got to ask here, see any good videos lately? <laughs> you must be talking about the Twitter thing. Yeah, it's the funniest thing. And, you know, whether people believe it or not, the truth is I'm at the gym. And we are working. We were, we were going to work out, me, my trainer and two other guys. But we were waiting on another guy to come in. And so we were just shooting the shit, shooting the time. And I found out that the city that I live in, in Florida, is the second largest for um, what do you call it, for swingers. Now, I've been here for 22 years. I was like, there's no way. I would have known that. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm up I'm up on everything. I should have known this, and I didn't know it. So anyway, he was trying to prove to me. He's like, yeah, because we were talking about different people in the gym. And we were talking about, yeah, they're swingers and they're swingers. I said, what the hell? I said, wait a minute. Where did all this come from before I got married? <laughs> you know? I'm like, what the hell? So then he goes, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Like yeah, road. So I and the website and everything. When you have when you go on a, on, a, on a website or another website, when you go on a, one of the twitters and it says sites you might want to see or whatever visit, well, it happened to be one of the porn sites. So I pressed it and I was like, oh man, I was like, I didn't know Twitter had all of this because on Instagram you can't do that. And if anybody knows me or follows me on Inst- on Twitter, I don't go on Twitter. I just have it. Last time I think I really went on Twitter, like, let me see, I like constantly was probably about eight years ago. But now when I go on Twitter, I just go on there just to promote where I'm going to be. So I'm looking at the videos and I'm laughing because this guy, this one guy, he had two guys and the, and, and the girl. And they were fucking like jackrabbits. You know, so it was like the Energizer Battery. So I'm laughing. We're all laughing at it. And so the other guy who was supposed to work out with us walks in. I go, oh, let me put it in my pocket. So that's where when I put on Twitter, it was a mistake. That's why I was like, guys, relax. It was a mistake. Trust me. And even if I didn't, even if it wasn't a mistake, I'm a 50-year-old man. If I want to like porn, I can like porn. What the hell is the problem? Regardless of if you like it or not. That's my business. But again, it was a mistake. People ran with it. And I was like, all right, whatever. Listen, if you're going to make me trend because I something was accidentally done on, on, on one of the sites and it happened to be porn, then so be it. So be it. Then I guess, I guess I'm going to be trending for that. Out of all the shit that I've done and all the shit that I could have been trending for that probably nobody knows <laughs> during the Attitude Era, uh, that got me. I'm like, come on, you're making a big deal out of it. So somebody in their parents' basement watches people who are in the public eye see what they like. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And now boom. And that's how all of that happened. It was truly a mistake. But again, even if it wasn't a mistake, it's my business. If I want to watch two dogs going at it and like it, then that's my problem. That's my business. Regardless if you think it's sick or not, if that's what I like, if I like to watch two dogs go at it, then I'm going to watch two dogs. You know, if I like to see two caterpillars go at it, I'm going to watch two caterpillars. God damn, boys, grow up. I mean, they act like I was looking at a kitty porn or something. Oh, my God, do you like porn? Oh, my God, dude, you're a legend. Yo, you're an OG. Watch what you watch what you like on, on Twitter. Your stuff is public. I don't give a damn if it's public. <laughs> hey, people got to make a big deal out of stuff. Uh, one thing I, I definitely wanted to ask Devon while we got you on here. Over the course of your career, man, career, you've been everywhere in professional wrestling. If it has mattered, you have been there. I was very curious, out of all the companies, which one presented you the most challenging uh, set of circumstances to get over with their crowd? Definitely WWE. No question. ECW, Paul Heyman was in me and Bubba's corner. Um, TNA, uh, same thing. But I will say there were some challenges in TNA. But thank God for Hogan and Bischoff that helped me with that run um, with the television title. It was because of them. You know, I've always said this. I never liked 
the last couple of years in TNA uh, because Dixie didn't believe in me and the powers to be behind her didn't believe in me uh, for me to do a singles run by myself. And I'm like, why? I've already proven myself. When you look at the matches between the Dudley boys and everybody else and Bubba admit to it, you know, I was the worker of the group, you know, and, you know, it was one of those things where TNA, Dixie, they wanted to put me at the wayside and think that I was just this guy that was hanging on somebody's coattails and never really made it. Screw you. I'm not that person, you know, and Hogan and Bischoff saw it. And when they gave me the the, the run after, you know, having the match with uh, Robbie E, it, it just soared from there. And I remember Bubba telling me that he screamed in the background because Dixie was sitting down and all the other officials were sitting down. When I won the title and the people were going crazy for it, they were like, that's how you get over. You screwed him over ever since we split up. And now he had to go out there and do it on his own. That's what you call getting over and not worrying about what the office does. You know, so I will always be grateful for Hogan and Bischoff for that. Um, And even Bubba, you know, Bubba was in my corner the whole time that whole thing was going on. I was very happy. I was very proud of what he had done and accomplished uh, with TNA. And they finally gave him the ball and let him run with it. Um, But it was a little bit of fight for me. But WWE, on the other hand, with the Reverend Devon gimmick, I didn't understand that. It was going great. We were doing promos with Vince. And I remember there were times when Vince used to say to me, I used to tell him what I was going to say. He goes, I don't want to hear it. I want to be surprised. I want to hear what you're saying, and then I'll play off of it. I was like, perfect. So for him to have that much faith in me to be able to take the promo that he has and come up with scriptures and things like that without me running it by him, apparently I was doing something right. And I always said this. When I wrestled Triple H, and this is at the time, Triple H didn't have the power he had now. And I I remember telling Stephanie and I remember telling Connor, I said, you probably weren't the Triple H that you are now back then you were definitely getting started and you were the son-in-law. I said, but you would have never laid down for me in the middle of that ring on SmackDown if you thought the Reverend Devon gimmick wasn't right. You know, and they were like, yeah, you're right. And, you know, again, Randy Orton, John Cena, Rikishi, Val Venus, Mark Henry, and, and Batista, along with, of course, Triple H. All those victories, if I wasn't doing my job, then why then why did you have me go over on these people? And these were your stars leading up to it. So it didn't quite set good with me why things like that happened over there when I had more than proven myself that I was able to do that. But again, I think somebody was in Vince's ear. And I've got an idea who it might have been, but I'll keep that to myself. I'll go to my grave with it. That And I've heard rumblings and reports about this. But the person who I thought it was, I don't think so much it was that person. I think it was somebody else within the organization at that time that didn't like me or didn't like what I was doing or it was getting over too much for them. And all you have to do is say the right thing to Vince at the right time and his whole idea and his own mind will change on you. And that's just the way he is. You know, he, he can love you today and have somebody say something to you, say something to him tomorrow and you're dead in the water. Listen, I, I don't care who you are. You can't tell me. You go back and look that the Reverend Devon character was not captivating, and that theme song was catchy. Oh, as it hell. was great. I thought it was great. Now, the first theme song, number one, I'm not a Catholic priest. I'm a I'm a black man who knows the the Baptist preacher. Both my parents are reverends, you know. And again, the outpour and love on my social media from all of the fans that remember the gimmick and that was there during that time all said the same thing you said. It was great, this and that. But again, the wrong person got in Vince's ear and that was it. It was over. I did have a fan question that ties into the Reverend Devon character. Mm-hmm. And what it was, was whatever happened to all the money that you raised as Reverend Devon coming I to the I think I said it best in my Hall of Fame speech. When I came back that first night, I'm sorry, the second night. The first night was unbelievable. The second night I came back, APA was next, and they stood there and they said, Devin? I said, yes, Ron and John. They said, we're going out drinking tonight, aren't we? I said, 
I guess we are. So all that money went to the APA building fund, not the Devon building fund. I wish. But what you going to do when Ron and John tell you you're going to pay for it, right? Yep. Number one, I didn't want to get killed. Number two, I didn't want to wind up in restless court, especially with Undertaker as the as the judge, you know, and Bradshaw as the prosecutor. Forget it. I would have lost. So I was like, yep, here you go. Here's the money. I'm still, I'm still getting paid from Vince, so here you go. <laughs> and to mention, think about this. <clears throat> and all the sheet writers that's going to probably look at this sh- because I'm on here because they always like to twist things that I say. Think about it. If the character didn't go over as well as they say they didn't, tell me something. Do you honestly think people would have came down from the Raptors to put money in my collection plate? If you go back and look at that, there were dollar bills falling out. Even Batista was shocked. He was like, what the hell? He was like, bro, you're like the new TV evangelist. If you ever stop wrestling, I was like, yeah, apparently I'm saying the right things at the right time. 100% agree. Devon, over the course of your career, what would you say is the best story you have seen told in a wrestling ring? Not necessarily a match, but the psychology of what you're seeing. I think right now what I'm seeing is the bloodline. I am a big fan of the bloodline. I love what they're doing, even this past Monday. And again, you know, my wife took out the USA Network because the cable channels, it was so damn high. My wife goes, no, I ain't paying for that cable. We're we're eliminating some channels. And unfortunately, the USA Network was one of those channels. Um, And I don't get to see Raw anymore. But what I do is when I go to the gym, I go to the gym at 5 in the morning every morning. So when I'm there, I'll go on YouTube and I'm doing cardio. And that's where I'll catch up on all the stuff from Raw. And I'll see, and they show everything on YouTube. So that's where I catch up. So that, in my opinion, is the storyline that I'm infatuated with, um, that I'm drawn to, and that I really get into, I really enjoy. I love what Roman is doing, and I especially love what the Usos is doing, especially when they use 3D. You know, when they called and asked me, they were like, do you mind if we use it? I said, bro, I've been, you asked me this three years ago, four years ago. I said, you even talked about it when we were wrestling each other. I said, you can't use it now because we're still active. I said, but once I became a, a producer for the company and you asked me, I said, freak yeah, use it. And then I remember Seamus and Cesaro tried it and botched it <laughs> because they didn't know how to really, like, you know, there's a unique way how I pick the guy up and Bubba comes in for the cutting. So if you've never done it before, then it's going to be a botch, especially with the guy coming down. When you bring him down, it's going to be a botch. So I do remember when Sheamus and Cesaro did it. They were like, Devon, we really messed that up. I was like, nah, nonsense. You guys did great. <laughs> and they like, and Cesaro, Cesaro was straight up. He's like, it sucked. He was like, I don't care what you say. <laughs> it sucked. You guys might have been an innovator, but I'm telling you, me and Sheamus botched that. And they did it every once in a while here and there. The Usos tried it once or twice on a live event that I produced. And I went to him. I said, just use the move. I said, Bubba and I are no longer together, so just use it. And it took him a while. And then once I had the back surgery and I was out for about, ooh, I think, three, four, four, four or five months at this point, I was looking at the pay-per-view when they first did it. And I went, oh, my God. I jumped up out of the bed. I went, oh, my God, he did it. And I was like, oh, God, my back. My wife goes, idiot. I go, yeah, I know. I got excited. <laughs> I remember texting them that night, and I said, man, you guys hit it perfect. Because I gave them tips on what to do and how to do it, and they did it perfect. And I'm very honored and happy and pleased that they're using the 3D. So, again, to go to the original question, it's the bloodline. Absolutely. Also, I was curious over the course of your career, Devon, what would you say is one lesson that you learned in your career that you didn't expect to learn, and how did it change your career afterwards? Hmm. Well, I will say this. During the Attitude Era, uh, I was too worried about a lot of times about um, partying and doing that because, you know, here it is. I'm a 20-something-year-old kid, you know, during the Attitude Era, and we were on top of the world. We were like gods you know back then everybody was watching especially when you're beating monday night football in the ratings and my thing was one of the things that was told to me that i wish i would have taken taken heed to is that concentrate on your career as opposed to going out partying with the boys because i think that that might have hindered a lot of stuff with me uh but i mean again you know becoming one half of the greatest tag team in the history of this business is not a bad feat in itself 
Um, but I just feel that maybe if I would have more worried about being in the ring as opposed to being outside partying with some of the boys, I think my career might have been, I don't know how it could have been better, but you know, it could have taken another step. I don't know. I just feel like, and I've always punched myself in, in the gut for that, for not just totally just concentrating just strictly on wrestling. Like Triple H. Triple H didn't drink or smoke or do anything. He didn't hang out. He solely did, uh, you know, concentrate on wrestling during his time. And I think that's what I should have done. I think that's one thing um, that bothers me a little bit, you know. But again, I can't get mad at my career and what I've done, you know, especially as a tag team, especially in TNA as a singles. You know, we, we did it all, going to Japan and doing all of that. I had a great career. Look, t- you know, 32 years of doing this, who would have ever thought that a, you know, young black kid from Brooklyn, New York, born in the projects, would have made a big name for himself in an organization that he grew up watching and loving? I love the WWE. Back then, WWF. I don't work for the company no more, so I don't have to worry about being politically correct. The WWF. Um, you know, I enjoyed my career to the fullest and I have nothing to feel bad or ashamed about. It's just one of those things where I'm just happy that I was able to do what I did. Perfectly said, Devon. One question another fan actually had brought up for me to ask on this episode was what match do you think put the Dudleys on the map? What was the most important match for the Dudleys? In WWE, it would have to be the ladder match. Um, with the Hardys at Madison Square Garden, I believe it was in 2000. Um, because I remember watching their ladder match. I'm sorry, it was a table match for us, but their ladder match, we weren't in there. We were. We, this was in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Gund Arena, and we're in the back, and we're kind of feeling a little slated, so to say. Because I was like, wait a minute, you know, we're not on the pay per view. We're brand new with the Dudleys, but nobody knew who we were back then. I mean, you know, we were fresh out of ECW. The percentage of people that probably saw us and knew who we were out of the WWE universe was probably five or ten percent, you know. Um, so we were kind of felt, you know, if the, if the WWE let the Dudleys be the Dudleys, then you'll have something. And I don't know if Bubba said something to Vince or somebody heard us, but we were told the next month we were going to have a tables match with the Hardys. And that pretty much put us on the map. Because remember, when we first came in, Bubba was still stuttering, and I was smacking him in the back of the head. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. <laughs> when he got me mad, but, you know, pop, pop. <laughs> No, but, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I felt that that really put us on the map uh, in terms of wrestling. And I think that's what started the feud with the Hardys. And then, of course, Edge and Christian was added with the TLC matches. And, of course, the TLC match, being my favorite of all my matches uh, in WWE history. I mean, <clears throat> you know, all three, the one, at Res- the one at WrestleMania 16, the one at SummerSlam, and of course the one at WrestleMania 17. And we did a couple of more in between those, but those three were the ones that I loved the most. Excellent, excellent. Now, for those who may not know, you do have two incredibly talented sons in professional yes. wrestling. And they're just starting on their career. How does it make you feel to see them break into professional wrestling and embark on their promising career? Well, I wasn't a fan of it at all at first because the trials and tribulations that I went through getting to where I got to, it was hard. You know, um, yes, I dealt with racism. Um, I dealt with people not thinking I was good enough or what have you. And when you have those elements against you, you kind of feel out of place, kind of feel more than slated, and you kind of feel worthless, especially when you have top officials that tell you, you know, uh, I don't like you because you're black, (laughs) you know, oh yeah, I don't want to say the name, uh, but yeah, there was somebody in WWE that said that to me, and again, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying any names, and this person, if he ever reads this or sees this article, I'll be able to tell him personally, yeah, it was you. Because, you know, again, I'm not the one to pull the race card. and I never planned on doing that. Um, I never told Vince about it. So, no, Vince didn't know. Um, you know, Bubba, 
Paul Heyman, Tommy Dreamer, and Spike was there when this person said it. Uh, it was in Indianapolis, Minnesota, and it was one of the WWE top officials. And uh, it was one of those guys that I can care less for. And, uh, you know, every time I see him, he's got to know I don't like him. <laughs> but it's a different ball game now because where he was when I got there, he's no longer in that position anymore. So as far as I'm concerned, I can care less about that individual. And if I ever see him again, I'm not going to be rude, but I will also try my best to make sure that, you know, everything goes as as planned, wherever I'm doing. 100%. Uh, Devon, before we go and wrap everything up, is there anything that you would like to promote or make sure the fans know about? I'm sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, no, you, hey, you're good, Devon. I was just uh, saying, is there anything that you want the fans to know about any upcoming appearances that we can promote for you right now? Oh, my God. I wish I had my book. Uh, <laughs> oh, I got it right here. Ah, got to love it. <laughs> I got babies coming in crying. <laughs> my wife trying to pull them out. Listen, it's a it's a big thing. <laughs> um, yeah, this um, this Saturday, I'm sorry, this Sunday, I'll be in Baltimore um, at the Celebrity Fest. Hold on, I gotta put my glasses on. Forgive my women glasses. <laughs> um, I'll be in Baltimore at the Celeb Fest, uh, sponsored by Windy City Promotions. Uh, and then the next time after that, uh, I'll be in Arkansas. Um, Little Rock, Arkansas, June 2nd and 3rd for an autograph signing there, the Comic-Con. And then, of course, Jacksonville, Florida on June 11th. I'll be there. And uh, Wrestling Classic on June the 17th in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I'm not going to read my whole calendar to you because there's a lot of appearances. You know, when I left the WWE in um, January 23rd, I never dreamt that what was happening was going to happen in terms of the countless autograph signings that I'm doing right now. Out of 52 weeks in a year, I've got I've, I've got booked in my calendar now 38 appearances, and they're still adding and growing. So, you know, thank you, WWE, <laughs> you know, doing that <laughs> uh, because the money is, you know, things have been great. Um, you know, I'm able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And uh, I don't have to answer to anybody. You know, again, I'll say this. I had a tremendous run with the WWE. I really did. Uh, thank you to Vince McMahon. Thank you to Triple H. And I better be careful when I say this name, Stephanie. Because, you know, I'll get I'll get told that Devon's obsessed with Stephanie again. And, you know, like they do all the time. And, you know, I wind up, hey, Triple H, watch it. Devon's after your wife. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I love my wife. I I'm, I admire Stephanie. I think she's a tremendous woman. Um, when I had my stroke in 2019, she called twice uh, to see how I was doing. And the first time she called on an answer, the second time I was with the doctor, and she left a great message saying, you know, I spoke to your wife. Everything is good. See, guys, she spoke to my wife, so I'm not trying to hit on her. Uh, <laughs> uh, she says, but I want to hear it from your voice that you're okay. Because I want to hear you. And, you know, I thought that was great. Because she didn't have to do that. You know, she did not have to do that. But she wouldn't rest until she heard me tell her I was okay. And that was the type of relationship that Bubba and I had with Stephanie. You know, we enjoyed her. We were we were threatened on putting her through a table. <laughs> you know, that was the biggest thing. We're going to put Stephanie through a table. And I remember we did a promo and I looked at him. I go, are you crazy? Do you know the ramifications of putting that woman through a table? <laughs> you know, but... You know, we had a lot of good times with Stephanie, and, you know, I, I could always be grateful for her. We had good times with Shane McMahon. I mean, just everybody within that organization, with the exception of that one person who I'm not mentioning their name, um, we had a great time. And I hold no ill feelings towards them. It was our time. It was my time to go. And, you know, you agree to disagree. And, yes, it did have to do with appearances and things like that, but you agree to disagree. And that's what it was about. So, again, 20 years with a 10-year, you know, absence because I was in TNA, but 20 years, you know, of wrestling and then producing, I would have never thought in a million years I would have lasted that long in that company, you know. But I had a great run, 
I had a tremendous run, and I've got nothing to feel bad or angry about. Perfect. Well, guys, uh, first and foremost, thank you again, Devon, for taking time from your schedule to join us on the podcast. And, guys, make sure to come out to all of the uh, dates Devon listed. Make sure to come meet Devon Dudley, one half of unquestionably the greatest tag team of all time and a tremendous person in his own right, Devon Absolutely. Dudley. Absolutely. I just want to say, if you look at my Twitter and you look at my likes, if I like porn, make me trend. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. We'll see you on the next one. bunch of jackasses. I'm sorry. You really are. You bought into all of that crap. Not saying I did it on purpose. I didn't do it on purpose. But I'm just saying, you you actually bought into all of that. I don't get it. I mean, again, it's, it's not like I was watching like some raggedy porn or something. I mean, it was raggedy. I mean, like two jackrabbits screwing. But <laughs> but exactly how you're laughing right now is how we laugh. So I'm sorry, guys, if I if I liked it or pushed the button by mistake. Whatever you want to say, I did. That's fine. But we had fun with it. Thank you for letting me trend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you next week. <laughs>